Ah, uh, okay, so a few points before we start. Firstly, I'm not the protagonist of this story. I just went to university with her, and though she went on to become a professional writer, I most certainly did not. She'll be taking over from me further on, but until then, please forgive my slightly awkward delivery while I give you guys the necessary context. Secondly, I, I don't know what you'll make of the following events, and I'm sure many of you might consider it all some sort of hoax. I wasn't present for what transpired in Phoenix, Arizona, but I can vouch for the person who wrote the following logs. She is not and has never been a fantasist. Okay, so I once knew a girl called Alice Sharma. She was an undergrad at Edinburgh Uni, the same time I was. My educational poison was history, a degree which has greatly benefited my career as a bicycle repairman. Alice Sharma studied journalism, though perhaps studied isn't the word. It's not an exaggeration to say that she lived and breathed the subject. Editor-in-chief of the campus paper, a recognizable voice of student radio. She was frustratingly tunnel-visioned, and she was a journalist in her own right before anyone gave her a professional shot. We met in student halls and became friends almost immediately. A meandering waster trying to stay off his parents' farm and an intrepid ambitious reporter may not seem like the most obvious pairing, but I just learned not to question it. She was inspiring and smart and she proofread all of my essays. <laughs> I'm not too sure what she saw in me. We were eventually flatmates down in London where she chased her dream and I chased my tail. She got a few jobs here and there, but nothing befitting of her skills. After months of fruitless internships and rejections, Alice called a flat meeting, telling us that she would be moving to America, accepting a position chasing stories for national public radio. The job came out of the blue the results of a Hail Mary application she thought had been dismissed out of hand. We threw her a bittersweet going away party and put the room up for rent. That party was the last time that I saw Alice Sharma. She dropped out of contact a few months after her departure, and I mean just complete radio silence. I assumed that she was just busy, so I carried on with my small but happy life and waited for her to pop up on television with some important words below her name. A chief correspondent, a senior analyst, something like that. The radio silence, though, was broken last week, and for reasons that you'll soon understand, I'm less happy about it than I would have thought. Arriving home from work, I found a lone email in my otherwise bare inbox, an email that would later be described as suspicious by my tech literate friends. Despite being born in the early 1990s, I didn't own a computer until uni, and I've missed several important lessons in the world of cyberspace. Uh, lessons like, don't call it cyberspace of course, and uh, more importantly, don't open emails with no text, no subject and no sender's address. I realize most of you would have deleted this anonymous blank email immediately. And my friends certainly would have too. But beyond my basic ignorance about online safety, something further compelled me to open it. The only thing of substance in the entire message was a zipped folder labeled left.right.as. I don't have to explain what I was hoping those final initials stood for, right? Opening the zip folder, I found myself staring at a stack of text files. Each one titled with a date, continuing sequentially from the very earliest file, 0702-2017. Uh, to any Americans in the room, this is the 7th of February. I've since read the files a few times 
and even shown them to some friends. They don't know what to make of it either, but they certainly aren't as concerned as me. They think Alice is just in a creative writing phase, and if I didn't know her, I probably would have agreed too. But the thing is, is that I do know her. Alice Sharma only cares about the truth, and if that's the case with these files, insane as they may sound, then it's very possible my friend has documented her own disappearance. The people who suggested this channel said that you guys discuss strange occurrences and stuff. If you guys have come across anything to do with what I'm about to share, or know of any people who are involved, then please, please send any information my way. Has anyone here heard of the left-right game? So... The document is titled, The Left-Right Game, Draft 1, 07-02-2017. They say that great stories happen to those who can tell them. Robert J. Guthard, though, is an exception to that rule. As I sit at his table, I sip his coffee and listen to him recount the past 65 years, it sounds like he's reading off a shopping list. Every event... His first job, his second wedding, his third divorce. None of them receive more than one or two sentences. Rob plows through the years. The curt, dispassionate curator of his own personal history. Yet, the story itself is so fascinating. So rich with moments and so wildly meandering that it somehow stands on its own merit. It's, it's a great story, no matter how you tell it. By the time Rob was 21, he'd gotten married, had a son, worked as a farmer, a mover, a boat engineer, and grown estranged from his spouse. Here's him talking about that. Well, of course, my wife started to get dissatisfied. I was away for a while. Uh, for work? <laughs> nah. Vietnam. You were in Vietnam? How was that for you? Well, I ain't never been back since. That was everything he had to say concerning his divorce and the entire Vietnam War. Rob had four marriages after that, and even more professions. After the war, he worked with a firm of private detectives got shot at once by the mob, and then he became a courier, which is how a poor boy from Alabama got to see the world. I've been to most of the continents with that job. I've been to India. Are you from India? Uh, my mum and dad are from India, yeah. See? I could tell. He'd been arrested once in Singapore, after one of his packages had been found to be full of white powder. He spent three days locked up before someone got around to checking the substance. It was just chalk, apparently. A friend he made, during his brief custody, Hiroji Sato, invited Rob to stay with him in Japan. And just getting over the breakup of his third marriage, Rob took the offer. And he stayed in Japan for another five years. The Japanese... Uh... They're good people, good manners, but they got all those urban legends and ghost stories that Hiroji was crazy for. They spent all this free time chasing them down, in fact. Like, you heard of Jirogamo? Ah, I don't think so. Well, she's this spider lady, lives in the Joro Falls, around Izu. Meant to be real pretty, but real dangerous. Hiroji took us out there to get a picture of her. Uh, did you ever meet Jirogamo? Uh, nah, she didn't show. None of them did. I didn't believe it all until we went to Aoki Gahara. Aoki Gahara, affectionately titled The Suicide Forest. 
Uh, that was the next stop on Rob's adventure. It's an area of woodland at the base of Mount Fuji. A notorious hotspot for young people looking to well, take their own lives. Hiroji, Rob's ghost-obsessed jailmate turned best friend, took him to Okigahara to chase Yuri, the ghost of the forest. So, did you find anything in Okigahara? Well, I ain't gonna ask you to believe me, but I was a PI, a professional cynic, and even I can't deny that there was a spirit in those woods. And from that moment on, Rob's sentences started getting longer. There was a childlike excitement creeping into his voice. I get the distinct feeling that we're moving beyond background, beyond Rob Guthard's old life, and towards his new one. The one that he actually wants to talk about. The one that led him to contact the show. It, uh, it walked up to me through the trees. It looked like static you see on a TV screen, but it had a human shape almost. Almost? Well, yeah, but it was missing an arm. It reached out to me, but I bolted out of that forest so fast. Hiroji never saw it. Holds it against me to this day, in fact. Hiroji had good reason to be annoyed. Rob says that Mr. Sato had been going to the forest two or three times per year for three decades. Uh, to have a rookie come along and claim to have seen a Yuri on his first trip, uh, I'd be more than a little cranky. But Rob didn't stay a rookie for long. In fact, it was in those woods that he discovered his current passion. Uh, the supernatural, or uh, more accurately, uh, the documentation and investigation of urban legends. Uh, legends like Bloody Mary. The Jersey Devil, a Sasquatch. Rob has looked into them all. Well, I figured if one was true, then who knows how many others could be. So, how many have you proven so far? Since Ahoki Gahara, ain't none of them had any proof to them. Well, except for one. That's why I called you guys up. At this point... Rob can't hope to repress his smile. The left-right game appeared on a paranormal message board in June of 2016. Only a few people frequently visited the forum, and of these regulars, only Rob took an interest in the post. The whole thing had a level of detail that you don't see in other stories. Well, what details grabbed your interest? Uh, logs? high quality pictures the guy documented everything said that he wasn't going to play the game anymore now, I think that he wanted somebody to keep investigating and you were that somebody? Well, that's right I said about trying to verify his information right away and how did it go? well it didn't take long to realise that the left right game it's real the rules of the left-right game are simple. Get in your car and take a drive. Take a left, and then the next possible road on the right, and then the next possible left. Repeat the process ad infinitum until you wind up somewhere. New, as they say. The rules are easy to understand, but Rob says that they're not so easy to follow. Well, there ain't all that many roads where you can turn left and right and left and right and just keep going like that. But most of the time, you find yourself at a dead end or needing to turn in the wrong direction. Phoenix is built on a grid system, so you can keep going left and right as long as you need to, really. So, did you move to Phoenix for the left-right game? Well, that's right. I try not to seem incredulous. Uh, selling your house in another state, uh, packing up and moving your whole life to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, just to play a game that you saw on the internet? <sighs> it seemed like insanity. Uh, Rob smiles as he reads my expression. 
I can clearly read his expression too. You'll see, it says. Just wait. I wouldn't have to wait long. Included within the nine-page submission Rob sent our show was a long list of suggested items the chosen reporter should bring with them. Clothes for three days. A pocket knife. Matches. Bandages. There were also a set of qualifications the reporter should have. The ability to drive, basic vehicle maintenance and its human equivalent, the first aid training. He didn't just want to talk about the left-right game. He wanted to take one of us along. Rob leaves a short while later to embark on a few errands, prepping the run, as he calls it. He shows me to the guest room and we part ways on good terms but very much aware of the other's poorly veiled opinions. He knew that I saw him as a charming obsessive, chasing after a fairy tale. And he saw me as a naive cynic, on the cusp of a new world. All I could think as I heard the front door close is that by tomorrow afternoon, one of us would be right. More after this. When I wake up the next morning, Rob is in my room, holding a tray which he knocked on the bottom to rouse me. I don't manage to record the start of our conversation. Uh, so, um, we've got uh, bananas, uh, strawberries, uh, I think we got some chocolate syrup. We got some more downstairs, but I wanted to wake you up to something good. We won't be eating this stuff on the road, okay? Rob has made me waffles. He sets them down on the nightstand and talks through the coming day as I eat. I'll admit, it feels a little uncomfortable waking up in a stranger's home to find said stranger already standing over me. But I quickly move past it. I tell myself that he's an older man, accustomed to living alone in his own house, not usually having to think about boundaries. Anyway, he certainly knows his way around a waffle iron. We hit the road at 9, okay? I wanted to give you some time to get ready before everyone shows up. Uh, there are other people coming? Uh, yeah. We got a five-car convoy on the road today. They'll be here in about an hour. This is the first time that I've heard of a convoy. And to be honest, I'm surprised. This game is Rob's obsession. And I'm here at his request. The idea that anyone else would have an interest in today's drive is a little perplexing, to be honest. Half an hour later, sated, showered, and dressed in the functional clothing Rob had so painstakingly outlined, I take my pack out to the porch. Rob's already there, waiting for his associates to show up. Uh, I thought that you'd be conducting a few more errands. If you ain't prepared by the morning of... You ain't prepared, lady. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's fair. Ah, oh, Rob, is the garage locked? The inside door won't budge and I wanted to mic up the car. Uh, yeah, it's locked up. I'll open it for you. Ah, uh, thanks. In fact, it's about time I wheeled her out. Fair warning, Miss Sharma. She's a thing of beauty. It's a Rob Guthard, a beauty took the form of a dark green Jeep Wrangler. Rob climbs in and lets it roll out of the garage, where it dominates every inch of the driveway. The car is large, four doors with a roof enclosing the entire compartment. It's also been modified extensively. Yet another example of Rob's dedication to the game. What are you thinking? Uh, well... I think you're two caterpillar treads short of driving a tank. <laughs> yeah, I fixed her up good. I put the winch in, heavy duty tires, the light rig on top is LEDs. Uh, they'll make midnight look like noon, but they don't use hardly any power. Aren't Jeeps open top usually? Uh, not at all. Uh, this is the unlimited. Uh, I like to have a covered car when I head on the road. I climb in and stow my pack. Rob had removed the back seats to afford more storage space. Uh, the place is packed to the brim. 
Jerry cans of gasoline, barrels of water, a rope, snacks, and his own neatly packed set of clothes. I wonder if the rest of our convoy would take the game so seriously. So, we got a polo coming up in 10 minutes, okay? No one else has given me a time. I sent the schedule weeks ago, and this always happens. His name's Apollo? Well, that's the call sign. Apollo Creed, I think he said. Why are you using call signs? Uh, did I not tell you? Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, we're going to use call signs on the road. Uh, keep communication clear. Uh, what's your call sign? A ferryman. Uh, what's my call sign? Well, I thought about it, and I was thinking London. You're from London, right? I'm from Bristol. Uh, Bristol. Well, that's fine, I guess. It's less than 10 minutes before Apollo turns the corner. Rob jumps out of his chair and paces briskly over to the edge of his property as his first guest pulls up and steps onto the sidewalk. Apollo vaguely resembles his namesake. Dark-skinned, tall, and noticeably well-built. Though it's clear that he couldn't be less of a fighter. This Apollo Creed is all smiles and seems to have a penchant for laughing at his own jokes. So, how far have you come? Uh, I've come out of Chicago. It took three days hard driving. And, uh, you know Rob from the forums? Everyone knows Rob. Rob's the god. <laughs> Rob walks over to Apollo's car, gesturing him over to talk shop. Rob's clearly impressed with Apollo's choice of vehicle. A blue Range Rover packed to the ceiling with Kit. I was more impressed with Rob himself, though. Somehow, this 65-year-old farmer's son had become respected in a vast online community. My dad is Rob's age, and he only just discovered copy and paste. The rest don't take long to arrive, too. Two Minnesotan librarians, also around Rob's age, pull up in a grey Ford Focus. They're brother and sister, and they've shared ghost hunting as a hobby their entire lives. I find it hard to suppress a smile when they meekly introduce themselves as Bonnie and Clyde. We would have gotten here sooner, but we had to drop by and get some blankets. A pleasure to meet you, ma'am. A pleasure to meet you, too. Would you be the journalist? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, you used to write for the town paper, didn't you? He's talking to his sister there, and she nods. Clyde is clearly the spokesperson for the pair, yet they both seem incredibly shy. Whether they admire the famous outlaws or just the name, it's pretty clear that they couldn't be more different from the real thing. Next to show up are Lilith and Eve, English lit students at New York University and proprietors of the YouTube channel Paranormicon. Unlike Bonnie and Clyde, Lilith and Eve have no issue holding a conversation. As soon as they learn who I am and what I do for a living, they attempt to conscript me for an expedition to Roswell. Yeah, we have a friend there. He's been seeing some... He's a seismologist. Yeah, and he's been recording readings over the years that show subterranean movement. A predictable movement. We're going to see him in July, but... We could work it around you if you're free. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'll have to check my schedule, though. Okay, cool. Let me give you my email. They quickly hurry off to film an intro for their latest video, featuring a quick interview with Rob, who seems pretty welcoming of the attention, to be honest. The last two cars arrive within a few seconds of each other. Aleth, a strong-willed older lady, who goes by Blue Jay, and a younger man going by call sign Ace. Blue Jay has arrived in a grade Ford Explorer. Ace, much to Rob's annoyance, has arrived in a Porsche. Uh, did you think that that's going to help on the road? I didn't write that. It's my car. What am I meant to do? I mean, it's my car. You didn't even read my itinerary. You got nothing packed in there. Uh, I did read it, sir, okay? Calm down, I have a bag. I won't ask you for anything. 
Well, I know that's true. Uh, Ace and Rob were off to a bad start. Ace takes a phone call, and despite my best efforts to get an interview with Blue Jay, uh, she doesn't seem interested in talking to a journalist. Uh, with five cars and seven travellers waiting for a green light, Rob hands out radios and charging packs, and then launches into a quick safety briefing. Uh, wear seatbelts, uh, stay in position, uh, communicate clearly and often. And it's at this moment that I start to feel a little dismay. I like Rob, and clearly so does everyone else. He'd convinced all of them to drive across the country to join in with this game. And I start to worry what will happen in the likely event that the whole thing isn't real. Would Rob lose his respect of his peers? Would he accept failure when it comes? After seeing the effort that he's put into these runs, the next few hours have the potential to be wildly uncomfortable. With a smile and a few encouraging words, Rob ends his briefing and beckons me over to the Wrangler. I clamor inside and make myself as comfortable as possible. You ready for this, Bristol? I'm ready. Okay, then let's hit the road. Uh, the Wrangler pulls out of the driveway, and the convoy follows in order of arrival. Apollo, Bonnie and Clyde, uh, Lilith and Eve, uh, Blue Jay and Ace keep a steady pace behind us as we come up to the first corner. Uh, Rob slowly and deliberately turns left, checking on the others in his rearview mirror. Uh, he looks back to the road as Ace's Porsche completes the first turn of the game. Shortly afterwards... Uh, Apollo checks in on the CB radio. Uh, this is Apollo for Ferryman. How many more to go, Rob? <laughs> as many as it takes, okay? I can tell Rob wanted to reserve the radio for something other than Apollo's quips. But he seems to like Apollo enough to let it slide. I'm not so sure Ace would have received the same treatment. We take the next right, then another left... Now safely assured that everyone's following correctly, uh, Rob speaks my thoughts aloud. You're wondering the same thing as Apollo is, aren't you? Uh, what do you mean? You're wondering how many turns that we're going to take before we hit some wall or something. Before you find out that this is all just a story. Uh, does that disappoint you? I'd be disappointed if you weren't thinking something like that. But now we're on the road... I gotta say something and you gotta listen to it, okay? Uh, okay. We're coming up to a tunnel soon. Anytime before we reach it, you can get out. Walk in the direction you like and you won't be in the game anymore. Once we go through, you gotta retrace the route that we took to get yourself back out of that tunnel. And that's when you're home. And you gotta convince someone to take you back in a car because I ain't ferrying you back 20 minutes in. You got till the tunnel to skip out on this. Understand? Uh, yeah, I understand. Though, I have to say, I am getting a little nervous. There ain't nothing wrong with a little nervous. We've taken 23 turns by this point. Already, I feel like we're traversing the city pretty efficiently. Rob's heavily modified Wrangler solicits a few impressed glances from passerby as well as several honks of respect from another jeep driver. Other than those few moments, though, everything seems completely indistinguishable from a regular morning drive. I even start to worry if there'll be anything at all to this story. A reporter takes drive with interesting man it isn't exactly Pulitzer-worthy. Turn 33 it leads us onto a short, unassuming street. A row of small businesses in a quiet Phoenician neighborhood. A liquor, a second-hand clothing, tools, and at the end of the street, a little shop selling antique mirrors. Ten or so people shuffle along the sidewalk, smiling, talking, planning their weekends. The only lone person is a young woman in a grey coat. I briefly glimpse at her at the end of the street, standing on her next corner. Uh, the back of her coat, reflected in 50 old mirrors. Even from a distance, I can see that she's sullen, wide-eyed and nervous. She shifts constantly on her feet, 
a tugging at the button on her coat. I look away to write some notes as we roll down the street. And when I look up again, the woman is standing by my window, staring right at me. She's smiling, a wide, unfaltering grin that seems almost offensive in its complete insincerity. Lambs at the gate, hoping for something better than clover, when all they'll find are things worse than slaughter. Ah, uh, Rob, what is happening? Just ignore her. He wanted to leave me, so I cut him out. The lady's hungry. It drank the wound clean. Uh, miss, are you alright? The smile vanishes. It snaps from her face, and suddenly, the woman is furious. What do you think you're doing? Have you gone mad? I reflexively press myself back in my chair as the woman, wild-eyed and gaunt, slams her fists against my window, with every intent of breaking through. Would you dance down the lion's tongue? I'll shred you, you whore! It'll shred you down to your sin, you fucking bastard! Rob puts his foot down, and the wrangler rolls defiantly away from the woman. As we turn the corner, I watch her as she retches. Her every movement cradled in abject hysteria. She yells despairingly at the rest of the convoy, bursting into tears when the last car passes her by. As she shrinks into the rearview mirror, I see her turn to a large mirror on the side of the shop, which the owner is in the process of polishing. I watch as she walks up to it, and with a convulsant scream, slams her head into the glass. The mirror cracks around her forehead, the owner jumps back in shock, and as the woman pulls her head from the mirror's surface, the fractured spider's web is dripping red. It all happens in a split second, and she quickly swerves from my viewers, or we take the next left. <sighs> Rob, what was that? Uh, she's there sometimes. What? On that street? No, on the 34th turn. What? Who is she? Honestly, I don't know. She's never acted out that much before, though. Must be a special trip. I find Rob's lack of concern a little unpleasant, to say the least. And his implication that this woman's ravings were the symptom of an internet game leaves me more than a little perturbed. As I see it, there are a few explanations for what just happened and none of them lead to a comforting conclusion. If, if we had just encountered a bona fide crazy person, then one could argue that Rob is just seeing what he wants to see. Maybe he'd bought into the game's story so much that every strange but explainable occurrence would be rationalized as the next step in his favorite paranormal narrative. Alternatively though, the woman could have been an actor, a more elaborate theory, sure, but not unheard of. People have lied to the show before, and Rob was receiving a ton of publicity for his attempt from Lilith, Eve and I. I admit, Rob didn't seem like a liar, but liars never do, right? There is a third alternative, however. An alternative which, if you put logic aside explains all the troubling little details that I couldn't help but notice. Because as strange as the grey woman was, isn't it stranger that no one on the street would react? I couldn't recall a single glance in her direction by anybody on the sidewalk. Perhaps that theory falls apart when you consider the shock on the mirror seller's face. But when I think about it, he only reacted once the mirror shattered, and even then, I feel like his attention was on the mirror itself, not the woman. Uh, Lilith to Bristol. Uh, Sarah, uh, I mean Eve, you got that camera on? Uh, do you have audio? Uh, yeah, I think I picked her up. <sighs> Shit, that was weird. Uh, can you send us the file when we stop? Can you also ask Ferryman when we're stopping? Hey, um, when's our stopping point? 
Uh, for them, in about 30 minutes. But for you, well, you tell me. And Rob turns off a busy street, just before a large intersection, onto a much quieter stretch of a two-lane road. Ahead of us, the road slopes downward, leading into an underpass which disappears into darkness. And we'd arrived at the tunnel. What is that supposed to pass under? Ah, uh, I ain't supposed to pass under anything. It's just there. And if we weren't playing this game, then it won't show. The question is, though, are you playing the game or not? Now, Rob turns to me. It's the first time that he's taken his eyes off the road since we started. He pulls the car to a slow stop at the mouth of the tunnel. You get out now and you can go wherever you want to go. But through there, you'll need a car to get yourself home. And like I said, mine ain't turning around for a long time. You understand? It's a dramatic statement. But unsettlingly, it doesn't feel like he's attempting to dramatize this thing. It feels like I'm having something genuinely asked of me. Am I ready for what's to come? Do I accept the risks involved? Do I consent to being taken down this road, and the next road, and the next? Am I prepared to see this game through, real or otherwise, to its end? What are you waiting for? Rob smiles and turns back to the road. He picks up the CB radio, holds down the button on the side. The microphone crackles. This is ferryman to all cars. Anyone want to step out, then pull to the side now. Otherwise, stay in formation and have some supplies at hand. We got a long ways to go. Much like the game I'm so tentatively playing, my view of Robert J. Guthard seems to change direction frequently. I'd heard all about his life, but I'm sure that I know him. I like the guy, but... I'm not certain that I trust him, and though I admire his dedication to the left-right game, I'm not sure I'll like where it might lead us. Yet, as he takes us into the tunnel, his face vanishing and reappearing under the dim sodium lights, I can tell that he expects this trip to be a major step in his already impressive story, and this time, for better or for worse... I'm along for the ride now.